If you live long enough, you're going to (laughs) die. Spoken that at a lot of funerals. And they're looking at me like, what the world? Think about that. If you live long enough, you're going to die. Is that true? So shouldn't it behoove us to kind of look at the end of life uh, and, and, and the way we want things to end up when we come to that point? Shouldn't, shouldn't we be a little more mindful of what we do as we head in that direction? Doesn't that make sense? Lord God so much for turning us on, tuning us in. I trust as always that the Lord's going to bless you up one side and down the other as we fellowship together here for the next 28 and a half minutes or so. We're going to be sharing with you tonight what has been perceived or might be perceived by many as a controversial subject or issue and I want to assure you that I'm not trying to be controversial at all on New Life Telecast. I'm actually uh, trying to help people understand a balanced approach to the Word of God. We're going to be dealing with the issue that's found in Ephesians chapter 6 And I'm going to jump right into it now, and it will introduce itself. And I trust that God would speak to our hearts and would would mellow our hearts and help us to understand His Word, His plan, His purpose for our life, that we might live it out regardless of whatever station we may find ourselves or whatever status we may find ourselves. Now listen, I'm probably speaking to some folks tonight that are just destitute of life. Maybe I'm speaking to some very, very poor people or those who are oppressed. There's just somebody else always pushing in on your life. I trust that you take great courage by this teaching and that it would lift you up. The powerful Word of God will do that for us. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 6. I'm going to begin reading in verse 5. and I want you to listen to these verses. We'll be be back to pray for you here in just about uh, 20 seconds and then we'll get on with it. Look with me. Ephesians chapter 6 beginning in verse 5. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but like slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not men. Because you know that the Lord will reward everyone for whatever good he does, whether he is slave or free. That is the Word of God. It is right. It is true. It is eternal. It will meet and speak to your need. Father, I pray for every person that's listening to this telecast, uh, whether it's over the, the TV program or the podcast, whatever the case might be, I pray that by your word you would speak to our hearts, teach us some things, and we'll thank you, we'll praise you for what you do in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hey, you hang on, keep your Bibles handy. If you have them, follow along and let the word of God speak to you tonight. God bless. I gave you somewhat of an introduction last week, and I'm not going back into any of that this morning for a couple of reasons. I'm just going to dive right on in. We're going to get started, so uh, you get your study notes and be ready to go and see if we can learn some things about this very unique passage. I left you with a question last week, and that, that I will reiterate to you, and it's something like this. Why in the world are these five brief verses in here, in the Word of God, and what can a free people learn from these verses? If you, like myself, believe that the Bible is the Word of God, and I trust that you do believe that, then you have to know that our Heavenly Father put this passage in here for 
a reason. And in that sense, if you dig a little deeper, and listen to it, let me see your eyeballs. I encourage all of you to dig a little deeper. Not, not just some cursory reading of the Word, or even so that you can say, you know what, I read through it this year. Take the time to read the words, to read the sentences, so that you can dig a little deeper and begin to realize what the passages are actually saying. If you do that with this one, you will begin to uh, discern that it absolutely applies to each one claiming a place among the body of Christ. I believe that. Now, at first glance, as you read through this, you may come away from this passage with the thought. I trust that you come away from the passage with some kind of a thought. But you may come away from that passage with the thought that God is giving instructions for slaves. So it must be that God is endorsing and enforcing Slavery. Well, let me answer that observation like this. I'm headed to number one on your study notes. Fill this in with me if you would, please. Beloved, we must consider. You don't have to, but I'm encouraging you to consider that Paul then was and Paul is now through this word. God is now speaking to persons who are already entrenched in a culture of slavery. In other words, slavery was birthed a long time before Paul arrived on the scene. Does that make sense? You with me? Wave at me if you're really here. All right, that's about half of you. We'll catch the rest of you here in a moment. How many of you know this? Listen to this. How many of you know that not all of Paul's neighbors and not all of our neighbors today have purpose to live out God's preferences? Is that right? Not everybody's following God. Not everybody's chosen to, to accept the Word of God, the Bible, and to live it out and to live out the principles that are established there. Not everybody has made that determination. Listen, that causes a lot of problems on planet Earth. And as one example, I want to take you back and look at Israel. And I would suggest to you that this, this example would apply to nearly every culture. In fact, it does apply to every culture and, and every generation. You find this in Judges chapter 2, verse 17. If you don't have your Bible, which I encourage you to have, but if you don't, it magically appears on the screen. Look at this. God says about Israel, Israel, however, did not listen to their judges. You understand God's judges? There's a book named Judges, and God had his judges. They were God's spokespersons, very much like what I'm doing right now, sharing God's word or serving as an uh, intermediary, if you please, between God and the people. And we're told here that they didn't listen to their judges. Instead, sounds like they made a decision. They prostituted themselves. With other gods, somebody tell me about other gods, the little g there. What is that telling us? It's telling us he's not talking about the God, but little idols, other gods. And they bowed down to them. They quickly turned from the way of their fathers who had walked in obedience to the Lord's commandments. They did not do as their fathers had done. By the way, I'm reading that from the Berean Study Bible, which is kind of a different uh, translation, if you please. So, took you there to say this to you. It's unrealistic to ponder the subject of slavery, either then or now or sometime in the future, as though every person is living as a born-again, spirit-filled believer because they are not. Listen, beloved, it is the nature of, of unrighteous persons, the nature of unrighteous persons to lift themselves to a position of status or authority over others. In other words, to kind of build myself up, to put other people down, or to put other people down in order to build myself up, to build up my own little world, and in the process something happens. To claim that I am more important to others and in that process something happens. Listen to the Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 4. We're told evil people are proud and arrogant. I don't want to remind you we come into this world with a sin problem. Evil people are proud and arrogant. And he says, but sin is the only crop they produce in the contemporary English version. Beloved, 
The ultimate end of such, of such pride and arrogance is this. Unfortunately, it is some form of mastery which must have inferior persons in order to survive. Headed number two on your notes. This passage, and I'm talking about our text passage. This passage doesn't deal so much with the broad subject of the pros and cons of slavery as it deals with the very specific of the behavior of those that had already or may find themselves victimized by this predicament of slavery. Will you catch this? We free people. How many of you are free this morning? We free people could very well find ourselves in slavery. We free people could very well find ourselves enslaved. Isn't that true? It is true. And there's example after example in the Bible of those who were free. And typically the way this works is they refuse to serve God. And God gives them over to some kind of servitude from some other people. And beloved, we live in a day and age where slavery and and servitude to others is just rampant around the world. We don't think too much of it in the United States, and I don't want to get ahead of myself here, but I do want to keep or continue to dangle before you that there is more than a possibility that you could end up in uh, the predicament of slavery at some point in time. Tyrannical and oppressive regimes have existed in one form or the other since that fateful day in which Cain killed his brother, Abel. Think about that. And as I continue to live, and I shared, had a conversation this morning with one of our newcomers, something about the age come up, and I suggested I was 61. And he said, well, that's funny, just last week you were 58. I'm like, well, it kind of seems that way sometimes, but I've been around long enough to observe some things, and I have observed that in this present world, certain things are happening, and and as I get a, a peek into the future by perusing such things as the revelation, which we read from at the outset of the service this morning, as I do so, one thing is quite clear to me, and that is that tyranny and oppression isn't coming to a conclusion anytime soon. Thanks for encouraging us, Pastor Terry. Hey, this is encouraging. It's the truth, and you need to know it, and hopefully you can adjust your life accordingly. Listen to Isaiah, and I want to take you here because today we hear all the time, we hear this party and that party and some middle party and this group and that group screaming about how we're going to have peace, peace, peace. They're all clamoring for peace. And God said through Isaiah, there is no peace. Who said that? Says my God, there's no peace for the wicked. For the wicked. Ezekiel come along and he said something like this in chapter 7 of verse 25. They will seek peace but find none. Wicked. Those who are in rebellion against the things of God, they can search for peace till the cows come home, whatever that means. I hadn't had a cow come home in years, but I think you know what I mean. So, took you there to tell you this. Through Paul, God goes deeper than the surface, physical, outward slavery in order to help those that may be victimized by such to know and understand something inwardly. Look at me. You understand outside and inside, don't you? You understand that? You understand? I think somebody named Freud made all this popular, but I don't want to go into all that. But you understand there's, there's the outside, and sometimes we do things on the inside to make people think on the outside that we're something else on the inside. <laughs> Write that down. That was profound. Say amen if you know I'm telling you the truth. You understand outside and inside. Listen, God's trying to help us understand something about the inside. And one of the things he's trying to help us understand here is, is though your flesh, though the flesh of the slave, if you please, may literally be in subjection to another. 
catch this church. I'm headed to number three on your study notes. These individuals, their outward circumstances may be beyond their control. Do you ever feel that way? That life is beyond your control? That that there are things going on around you that's beyond your control? Still yet, God's trying to help us understand that He has purpose for the spirit of man. I want to remind you once again, there's more to you than meets the eye. There's more to you than just the flesh. There is the soulless realm and there is the spirit man. And God has purpose for the spirit of man to be freed up, if you please, so as to benefit from a relationship with Him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I get excited when I think about that. Can you tell? God wants you to be in a relationship with Him in the present. And watch this. That's not the end of it. He also wants you to spend eternity with Him in the life to come and the world to come. And can I remind you today, this sounds kind of creepy, but it's true. If you live long enough, you're going to (laughs) die. Spoken that at a lot of funerals. And they're looking at me like, what the world? Think about that. If you live long enough, you're going to die. Is that true? So shouldn't it behoove us to kind of look at the end of life uh, and, and, and the way we want things to end up when we come to that point? Shouldn't, shouldn't we be a little more mindful of what we do as we head in that direction? Doesn't that make sense? Makes sense to me. God wants us, beloved, to be in relationship with Him now and spend eternity with Him later. And I have to say this to you this morning. I trust that you pick up on these little subliminal messages. If you want to spend eternity with God, then you have to make things right now. It's too late after you draw your last breath. I didn't really plan to say all that, but I done took and did. Say amen right there. Listen. Why is this here? I'm asking that question. Why these five brief verses here that seemingly promote slavery? They're not. They're here to help us, beloved. They're here to, uh, really, instead of touching on outward aspects embraced by those who purpose to exact mastery over others, this passage is here uh, rather to establish a positive means by which those that might find themselves caught up in this hideous evil. It's it's given to, to help us understand how we are to react if we might get caught up in such a circumstance, such a predicament. How many of you know that born-again persons are purposed to act and react differently? And we're going to get there. I just wanted to throw that out. We're going to talk about that again here in just a moment. I want to suggest something to you very significant, very significant to me, that this passage dealing with masters and slaves, this passage is right on the hills of several other passages dealing with that, which I'll broadly describe as submission verses. If you would go back to messages of several weeks ago, and you go back to chapter 5, around verse 21, we introduced to you the whole concept of mutual submission, relational submission. I am to be in submission to you, you are to be in submission to me, mutual submission. As you go on from 22, chapter 5, 22 to, to 33, Paul introduces and lays out a tremendous uh, argument and a, a really crystal clear picture about how submission is to work in the marriage relationship. So there's relational submission talked about. There's marital submission talked about. And then you enter chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, and he talks about how children are to obey their parents. A parental sub- submission, if you please, or child submission. Submission is a posture. Look at your neighbor and say posture. All of you didn't say that. Come on, we'll never get to clearances. Look at your neighbor and say posture. There you go. Thank you. Submission is a posture that has its roots in the heart. This is important. It has its roots in the heart and it's spiritual in nature. Submission begins as an inward attitude of the heart. Fill in number four with me. By contrast, slavery is a heinous evil that comes against a person from the outside. And I think it's right to say that slavery is 
physical in nature. Submission, spiritual in nature. Slavery, physical in nature. Said that to say this, God here in Ephesians chapter 6 is doing what He always does. We pointed this out time and time again over the last many messages as we've preached through uh, this particular part of the, the Word of God. He does what He always does. He deals with the heart. He deals with the spiritual instead of the physical. Why did I go through that little routine a while ago about us being able to decide things on the inside that will make it look like we're something that we're not? On the outside. It's important to know that. Listen to me. Listen to me. Especially if you think you're fooling someone by the way you live or the way you are tricking them into thinking you live. God knows your heart. David said this Search me, O God, and know my heart. Search me, O God. Y'all catch it? Search me, O God. And know my heart. Wow. What he is doing is helping men of every generation understand that no person can ever hold your spirit or your soul captive. Even though some man or woman may bind your hands and feet. That one cannot shackle your spirit. Regardless how they might overpower and oppress your flesh, they can't do that to your spirit. I take great courage in that. No one on the outside of you can determine for you whether you choose to make God your master, or whether or not you choose to make God's heaven your eternal home. No one outside of you can make that determination for you. Isn't that good? Now hang on to that, because I'm going to shift gears right here, and I hope I don't let the clutch out too quick and burn rubber right here in front of you. Listen. Interestingly enough, one of the greatest commentaries on this passage actually appears a little bit later in our Bibles. By the way, not all of the books are given in chronological order. I don't know why God did it that way, but that's the way it turned out. I am speaking at this point about this tiny little book of Philemon, probably one of your favorite books. Amen? Can I get a grunt? I think I just did. One little chapter. How cool is that? Listen to me, church. Don't let the length of the book fool you because the content is enormous. It's enormous. Philemon, the book, was originally, as is the case with many of the letters in our New Testament, but the Philemon, for sure, was a personal letter given at the hand of the Apostle Paul. I am convinced, and you can differ with me on this, But I believe that God guided Paul's hand as he wrote this. I believe that it is inspired by God. All Scripture is. This was originally a personal letter given at the hand of Paul, and it was addressed to this cat named Philemon. Let me tell you about Philemon. He was a very rich man, and he lived in a place called Colossae. You would connect that to the Bible book of Colossians. By the way, This passage in Ephesians chapter 6 is a parallel passage to Colossians chapter 3. They were both written at approximately the same time, coming from the same inspired pen of Paul. And as well, this letter of Philemon was all connected. They're all very much interconnected because they come uh, from Paul's prison experience from Rome at approximately the same time. Told you that to get to this. With reference to Colossae, no city is there today, it's only ruins. There was a city there today, it's just in ruins, and it was a great city during Paul's day. Now, the back story of this tiny little epistle is deeply rooted in the issue of slavery.
Beloved, we're going to cut in right there. There's more to this. I'll look forward to sharing it with you. But I trust and pray that someone that's listening tonight would take great courage from this. There may be some man, some other person, some outside force, maybe even some financial situations just pushing you down. It's causing a lot of pressure. In fact, I want you to listen to me. Perhaps you've made an ill-fated decision that's put you in that situation. You're suffering from that. And, and then the torture sometimes of knowing that we're in a situation that we're in because we made a dumb decision. Regardless, the great God of the Bible, the great God of creation, is able to do it seeding abundantly above all that we ask or imagine. He can bring you up out of that. You may say, Preacher, it's my fault that I'm here. I understand that. I've had those situations in my own life. But I know that God is a loving, caring, merciful God that knows the limitations of our flesh, and yet He has purposed through His Son, Jesus Christ, to reach into our lives to bring about a healing and a help and a wholeness unlike anything this present world could ever produce. I pray that you'd turn to the Lord and trust Him to bring you up out of that situation and to, to establish your feet on the rock, which is Jesus, and you can begin to watch your life grow. You can begin to watch things change in your life, your family, your community, your church. It's amazing. Uh, the speed in which God can bring about some miraculous moves in His life if we simply trust Him. Now, if you don't believe and you don't get started, you do not take that first step. You're never going to see this. Be encouraged to take that step with a determination that you're going to take the next step and the next step and the next step until you see God working and moving in your life in some phenomenal ways. Father, I pray for every man, woman, boy, or girl that's listening to this message, to this teaching time, and I pray in the power of the Spirit that you would minister their needs. Help them to know and understand that you, Father God, have provided us a remedy for our sin in the person of Jesus Christ, and you've given Holy Spirit to dwell within, to enable us, to strengthen us, to empower us, to be more than overcomers. Lord, if you did it for those uh, people in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, and, and those that were in bondage and slavery, you can do it again, and I pray that you would according to our faith. We pray, we ask in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Hey, I do want to remind you that New Life has a regular schedule of activities Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. The, the messages that you hear on New Life telecast are on the podcast. Uh, they're taped live during our morning worship celebration. We also have midweek activities. We call that Family Ministries Night, and what a great time. We are a family, and we'd love for you to be a part of that family. If you have any questions, concerns about what we talk about here on New Life, give us a call. The contact information is there on the screen. We'll look forward to hearing from you. I got to get out of here. Again, I want to thank you for being with us for these few moments. I am Terry Knight, the pastor of New Life Community Church, wishing you a great week. And remember, my friends, Jesus is coming back. Is he coming back for you? Lord God. God